we're going to jump into the questions. We got some heavy ones here. This is not quite the heaviest one, but it gets deeper. I went to the chiropractor for an adjustment, as you said, because I do believe in chiropractic care. And uh, my th C3, that's your third cervical vertebrae in your neck, was out. Now he has me coming back three to four, every three to four days. I am truly hived out around C3 to C1 to C3. I don't know what that means completely. Maybe they have a rash. Maybe they feel irritated around that area. Along with T5, my immune system doesn't like the applicator tips. I'm assuming that's the tips that the, the chiropractor is using for adjustments. I'm not positive. The chiropractor suspects neuropathy. How do you determine if all the treatments they suggest are necessary? I told him I need a break to let the sore inflamed areas settle down a little bit. Do you have any suggestions? if any of the Rife uh, or Sequix programs will help. A lot of questions there. So number one, if you have some inflammation, definitely do the Rife programs. I would do accelerated healing on the Rife. Do any of your sequence programs would be helpful for this. So I would say uh, absolutely. Uh, if you have inflammation there due to what the chiropractor is doing, I would honestly suggest maybe looking at a different chiropractor, possibly. Um, yes, I do believe that when you start making changes to your spine, and um, there might even be good changes, adjustments, that it could be more sore to begin with than it than uh, in order to heal. And uh, getting back to the first question, how he, uh, he has me coming back every three to four days. How do I know if that's too much? How do I know? Well, that's a tough decision. So a lot of chiropractors practice different ways. That's the pro and con of chiropractic. There's some that, you, that practice on a basis of what's called straight chiropractic, and they just believe in the chiropractic philosophy of getting adjusted on a regular basis is good for you. I tend to fall into that category. There's other chiropractors that practice corrective chiropractic, and there's a time that I practice that way. And those are the people that are taking x-rays, very specific x-rays, and then they're working along the process of changing those x-rays and being able to take after x-rays to show that there's a change in that um, in what they've done. So I don't believe that's the chiropractor you went to. I believe that um, they're, the way it sounds, though, if you worded this question, they don't have any objective data that is proving um, that you need to come back or not. They're just saying that this is really out. They've palpated that and you need to come back. If what he or she is doing isn't making you feel better, then um, then maybe that's not the place to go. And again, I know that sometimes when you first start getting adjusted, it doesn't feel better to begin with. But after a number of treatments, you know, you better improve, your symptoms better improve, or you want to go to somebody who is maybe more specific in their technique. Uh, well, I never want to bash another doctor or say anything ill about another doctor. I think it is wise to, um, to make sure that you're, that you're getting the best care um, that you possibly can. If you don't feel like you're getting good care from me, you should, you should confront me about that as well, just like you should confront any doctor. Question came through in the chat, are you okay with getting x-rays at a chiropractor? I would say yes, I would be okay with getting x-rays. Matter of fact, my, uh, okay, one x-ray of the cervical, uh, AP and lateral x-ray, that's two x-rays of your cervical spine. In my mind, that would be extremely wise because you got somebody that's adjusting your spine. Um, I used to take x-rays when I did chiropractic, and I many times I found things on an x-ray that made me not want to adjust their spine. Uh, and um, uh, one time there was a fracture of a vertebrae that um, I picked up on the x-ray, and if I would have adjusted that person, you could have could have injured that person severely. So especially if you have a history of cancer, you should be going to a chiropractor that's either adjusting you with a very low, low, low force technique where there is absolutely no possible fracture 
that could be ensued in that type of technique, or they better take an x-ray of your spine to make sure that you don't have any, you know, God forbid, metastasis to your spine, and that's what's causing the pain there, and then they adjust it, and they actually fracture the vertebrae. So, yes, I think it is a very good idea to take an x-ray uh, given any uh, cancer history. There's no way when I practice chiropractic that I would take on a cancer patient for chiropractic care without seeing a full set of x-rays so that I make sure that they don't have metastasis. Um, that's just downright dangerous. So you should have that. Now, if they're just doing an activator technique or something like that, you could still hurt somebody with that. So you got to be really careful. Next question. Upon reading some of the RIFE programs, I ran across um, adenovirus, conjunctivitis, and canker sores. Uh, it stated that cold sores or canker sores are one of the main causes of Alzheimer's. Is that true? Uh, I would say there isn't evidence that that's true, but there is a belief that Alzheimer's can be, uh, uh, that uh, herpes viruses can be a contributor to some Alzheimer's events. Um, but I would not say it's a main cause of Alzheimer's. It said to alkalize the body, use L-lysine, vitamin D, and curcumin, which latch onto plaque formation. So alkalizing the body is important because remember we had a Zoom call a few weeks or months back that spoke about cold sores and what cold sores are. Cold sores are herpes virus that lives in the nerve ganglion. So a nerve ganglion is a nerve bundle. So if you had cold sores in your mouth, it's usually in the trigeminal ganglia that's up in your upper cheek. And it lives there, and it's really hard to kill. Even if you ran the herpes program all the time with the rife, you're never going to completely kill that the herpes virus. It's probably going to be with you the rest of the, your life. And it comes out when there's a change in pH. So that's why when you lay in the sun for the first time, that changes the pH in your mouth, and you could get cold sores. Or you suck on a lemon, that's very acidic. You could, it changes the pH of your mouth, and you could get cold sores. Well, did the lemon cause the cold sores? Did the sun cause the cold sores? Am I allergic to the sun? Do I have an allergy to lemons or limes? No, you don't. It's just the pH change in the saliva that allowed the opportunistic organism, the herpes virus, to travel down the nerve and to expose itself with an inflammatory pustule on your lip. So changing help alkalize the mouth, and I said in that, in that um, uh, previous Zoom call, by even taking a calcium tablet, licking it, and dabbing the calcium tablet on the herpes uh, cold sore can be helpful. Um, uh, uh, so chewing up a calcium tablet, how gross that might be, and it tastes like chalk, but that can help instantly change the pH of the mouth uh, through the mineral content in there, or any other mineral will help with that too. Lysine is a good amino acid for decreasing cold sores, especially people who have chronic cold sores, and vitamin D is very important too because that helps the absorption and cell function of calcium and helps with uh, mineralization. So that's really good too. You can certainly follow the rest of the instructions on this as well as running the herpes programs and stuff. The other part of this person's questions was, upon awaking is when I get small blisters appear on the inside of my mouth. Is it possible I become more acidic overnight? Yes, it is very possible. And one thing that might help that is literally uh, opening up uh, uh, one of your mineral capsules, dump it in a little cup and uh, dabbing your finger, wetting your finger, dabbing it in there and just kind of sucking on that a little bit, especially before you go to bed to help decrease the uh, or increase the pH of your uh, mouth before you go to bed so that that might prevent that. Next question. Uh, I was referring to some uh, video that this person watched this this doctor on the video said something about loading up with antioxidants while doing chemotherapy so that the chemo will target more of the cancer cell and the antioxidants will protect the healthy cells. So I know you recommend water fast, but I wonder what you think about that. 
it seems to make sense to me to load up with antioxidants right before chemo, like doing a berry smoothie or something like that? That's a very good question. So, but here's why it's a really good question. So I put together a couple pictures that I just pulled off the internet a couple minutes ago. And to understand the answer to this question, you have to understand a few things about what chemotherapy is doing to a person's body purposely. So first of all, we have to understand how cells die. So here's a healthy cell, nice happy cell here, smiling, big mouth open there. These are actually parts of the cell. But a cell dies through three main processes. One is normal programmed cell death. That's called apoptosis. That's what's not taking place with a cancer cell. So normally cells are supposed to live a certain period of time. And then on the outside of the cell membranes, things attached to it, stimulate a process that goes inside, on inside the cell that stimulates this normal programmed cell death, this apoptosis. These particles of the cell break off and the cell gets partially really recycled. So that's a normal program that takes place in the cell when that cell is ready to die. Cell death is actually a beautiful thing and your body reuses a lot of parts of that cell. And there is, in this process, there is no waste, there's no uh, Herxheimer reaction by the patient, uh, you're not toxifying your body with cell particles because your body is, is reusing these pieces and it's cleaning it all up. The other type of cell death is called autophagy. And we've spoken a lot about autophagy. We've spoken a lot about apoptosis. So this is how your body cleans up things in the cell, inside the cell itself and the cells themselves. It cleans things up. This is how you clean up dead tissue. The third type of cell death is an abnormal type of cell death. It's called necrosis. Necrosis is when you uh, is when cells die due to being poisoned. So if you uh, consumed a deadly toxin and you died from that deadly toxin, it was because too many cells went through necrosis and that's what killed you. So the deadly toxin caused necrosis or lysis of the cells. So a necrotic cell dies through the process of lysis. So cell lysis is when the cell literally explodes due to a toxin and you, it can make you sick. So for instance, uh, a, a, a necrotic process that doesn't kill you could be, let's say I cut my skin really bad and I wound up and, I, and it forms a scar and a wound, and then that wound falls off, right, in, in, uh, after a period of time. That's necrotic tissue. It died it through cell lysis, through an abnormal, not through apoptosis, not through autophagy, but through lysis. Another example would be, I got strep throat, and my throat is super sore, and I'm coughing, and I had this really bad pain. I had a ton of cells die in my throat through the process of necrosis, through bacteria killing cells. But it didn't kill me. My body eventually overcame that, killed the bacteria, and my body created new cells to line my esophagus, and I can speak again, and I don't have a sore throat anymore. But that's the process of lysis through necrosis, that's an abnormal or pathological cell death. When you do chemotherapy, this is what's taking place. So chemotherapy is causing lysis and necrosis. So even if the chemotherapy only killed the cancer cells, you still would get sick from chemotherapy because if when the chemotherapy kills the cancer cells, all these dead particles, because the cancer cells basically exploding, that's causing all these particles from that cell 
to be dispersed into the tissue that's picked up by the lymph that's dumped into the blood that's causing an overwhelm of the liver and you feel sick. So this necrosis or lysis of a cell, this pathological death of a cell because of a strong drug given to the patient called chemotherapy that is a poison hopefully only uptaken by cancer cells, but we know that's not necessarily true, is killing those cells. Well, we wanted to kill the cancer cells. I don't mind being sick from the cancer cells dying, and honestly, I don't mind my patients being sick from the cancer cells dying. Hey, we can overcome that sickness. But the problem is the cancer cells are not the only thing that is killed through necrosis or lysis when we take a strong poison like chemo. But this doctor is saying we should take an antioxidant to protect the healthy cells. Well, I see one ginormous problem with that. So now we have to understand the difference between oxidation in my cell, pro-oxidants, and antioxidants. Well, shouldn't I always be taking a ton of antioxidants? Wouldn't that be good for me? Yes and no. So we need this struggle between pro-oxidation and antioxidation. We need to have a struggle here. This is the balance in life. Remember I've said numerous times that there isn't anything in, that goes on in your body that is necessarily all bad, but there isn't anything that goes on in your body that's necessarily all good. It's about a balance. You have oxidating processes that take place inside your cells, and then those are balanced out by antioxidating processes that are taking place inside the cell so that you don't ever have too much of this nor too much of this because you need some oxidation that goes on inside the cell and you need antioxidation that goes on inside the cell. Now, chemotherapy is a pro-oxidant. That's what makes it a poison and that's what makes it effective against a cell. So pro-oxidants are going to kill cells. So let me show you this slide. So for those of you that we've done your genetics already, you may have seen this. If you haven't watched any of my genetic videos, I'd suggest you do so because I go over this ad nauseum. This here is your transsulfuration pathway. The purpose of this pathway is numerous, but one of the major purposes of this pathway is to make glutathione, which is a cellular antioxidant that works inside the cell as an antioxidant. So here's the detox pathways right here that are making these antioxidants in a person's cells. If I have defects along any of these genes, that's why we need to look at these genes, we're not gonna make a lot of glutathione, we're not gonna get rid of oxidants. So what are the major oxidants that are, that are in our body? They are what are called free radical or reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species. So ROS and RNS. So these reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species or these free radicals damage cells and they can cause what? Lysis or necrosis. They can cause cancer. Well, we don't want those. We want to get rid of those then. Well, that is true. But in the wisdom of your body, you actually make some oxidant species. You make superoxide ion and you make peroxynitrite. What's the purpose of that? It's so dangerous. Why would we make that? Why is infinite wisdom created that we actually create superoxide and peroxynitrite in our body? Because it actually has a purpose too. So superoxide and peroxynitrate are free radicals. That means they have an extra electron open on their electro, uh, um, um, on the compound. So they will attach, they are attracted to attach to things. If they attach, if we have excess amounts of them, they can attach to our cells and they can damage our cells and they can cause heart disease, they can cause cancer, they can cause all sorts of bad things because they cause oxidative damage, cell and tissue damage, 
and we could get cancer and all sorts of diseases from it. But we make it, why would we make it? Because they also can attach to bacteria and viruses and things that are in our body constantly to keep the balance of those things down. So we don't want to have none of these, but we don't want to have excess these. It's about balance. So how do we know we have too many of these? Well, we could discern if I have a disease that is caused by oxidative stress, pretty good chance I might. Well, what are those? Heart disease, coronary artery disease, arterial sclerosis, cancer. We could go on. Do we have those diseases? Well, we should probably check. Do we have high amounts of this? Well, one other way to check is let's look at your genes. If I have a bunch of defects on this gene right here, the SOD gene, this SOD gene makes superoxide dismutase. It makes superoxide dismutase for the purpose of getting rid of superoxide and peroxynitrite. Question came in, how does ozone therapy get oxygen to the area of the cancer and cause the cancer to not grow or to thrive? Good question, but this is not oxygen here. So this is O2 negative. So there's actually a missing little negative sign there. So this is a, this is an O2. Apologize for that. Whoever did this uh, graphic missed the little negative sign there. And this is O-N-O-O, -O, abbreviated O-N-O, but it's actually called peroxynitrate. And this is actually a free radical also. So adding oxygen to your tissue helps decrease these because it will attach to these two. So increasing oxygenation of your tissue helps right here as well. So if I go out and exercise, I'm increasing my oxygenation, it's gonna decrease free radical formation. If I'm going in a hyperbaric chamber or I'm going to use ozone, that can help donate an oxygen and get rid of this. That can help with this. But your body, so you're doing that exogenously. You're trying to add a therapy to help do that. But normally within the cell, this superoxide dismutase gene is making superoxide dismutase to grab onto superoxide and turn it into hydrogen peroxide and then glutathione and catalase through these genes, through these pathways, get rid of hydrogen peroxide turn it into water, and you pee it into the toilet. So this is all about the balance here, pro-oxidants, antioxidants. So normally, let's say I'm not doing chemotherapy right now, normally, what could cause an increase in the pro-oxidants and an increase in cancer? Defects on this pathway. Defects on this pathway right here. Defects on this pathway. So we look at these genes to go, Oh, wow, you don't have any defects here. You don't have any defects here. No defects here. That's great. So are there other reasons why a person would have a lot of pro-oxidants? Sure, a really crappy diet. So what we talked about last week, eating a lot of sugars, causing a lot of excess uh, 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 um, free radical formation. Uh, being around, you know, going and getting radiation, uh, going and getting, okay, should I get x-rays? Yeah, you could get some x-rays, cervical and spinal x-rays, a few x-rays aren't going to hurt you. But if I'm going to get in a lot of CT scans, one CT, one abdominal CT scans equivalent to about 50 x-rays. Well, I had four of them this last year. That's 200 x-rays. That's going to cause a lot of free radical damage. It's going to increase the production of free radicals. You better have really healthy SOD and glutathione pathways and catalase pathways to get rid of them. So there's different things. I'm exposed to pollutants. I'm smoking cigarettes. I'm, you know, whatever it is that you're exposed to that increases oxidation increases reactive oxygen species, increases octavate, octavate, uh, oxidative stress. That my antioxidant system here can't keep up with. Okay, you're boring me to death, Dr. Connors. Get to the point. Well, the point is, is when you're doing chemotherapy, you are purposefully adding oxidants 
to the body for the whole purpose of causing this to the cancer cell. I know we have to kill these cancer cells. Let's poison them. Good idea. How are we going to prevent the other cells from being poisoned? Well, this doctor said we should take a whole bunch of antioxidants, a whole bunch of things that will help pr uh, promote this pathway. Well, should we? Um, no, I don't think so. Maybe 48 hours after you do the chemotherapy, I would do that. I would not take a whole bunch of antioxidants prior to the chemotherapy, you know, the day before, the day of, the day after, I would wait at least 48 hours after the chemotherapy. Because if you're going to subject your body to chemotherapy, you want this to take place to cancer cells. If you are going to add antioxidants, you are not only going to protect healthy cells, you are going to protect cancer cells. So you don't want to hyperload on antioxidants prior to chemotherapy. You want to, if you're going to take chemotherapy, you want the chemotherapy to work. Then after 48 hours, then you hyperload on everything else that we have you going. That's why follow that, that, that sheet that we have that I created uh, on, as, a, as a, a resource for you, for those who are doing chemotherapy, in our blog post. You guys should be looking at our blog posts. So under our resources page, there is a blog that I created for, it's a, it's a sheet to do if you're doing chemotherapy, follow these things. So it does not say hyperload on antioxidants. So don't do that because you want the chemotherapy to work. Yes, is it going to cause necrosis of healthy cells? Uh, yeah, that's the bad thing about chemotherapy. There's nothing you could do about that. But you can stop the progression of it because chemotherapy is going to kill the cancer cell really within the first 48 hours. After that, we want to load up on antioxidants, detox the body, do your foot baths, cleanse the body of that chemotherapy so it can decrease the effect on healthy cells. And that's the whole idea of fasting the day before and the day of the chemotherapy too, because that gives healthy cells protection. It does not give the cancer cells protection, and that's been proven.